Okay, well, it's one o'clock now. This is Kate from Via Sports Speaking. So to start with, I really want to thank everyone for taking um, some time out of their day to, to join us in, in uh, listening to some, some uh, effective practices or some more information about the responsible coaching movement and um, to help us welcome Shelley Coolidge from the Coaching Association of Canada. So I would appreciate if everyone could mute their lines while we're listening to the webinar. And if you do want to ask a question throughout, please feel free to add in the chat box. Or if you do want to speak, you can unmute your line there. But we'd much appreciate muting your lines during the session. Um, so I would like to welcome Shelley Coolidge, and I'll turn over the presentation to her at this time. Um, so she'll be leading us through the, the discussion. Um, we will have a couple poll questions, so we will ask you to participate in those when you can, so you can provide us some feedback about what you're doing, what you're challenged with, um, so that we can better learn how to support you through this. So, Shelley? Thank you very much. So first off, again, I'd like to thank Via Sport BC, uh, Kate and Robin for organizing this webinar and for providing the Coaching Association of Canada with the opportunity to speak with you here today. Again, our goal is to do what we can to support you and work with you uh, and work with Via Sport in supporting you to develop best practices around keeping our children and vulnerable sector safer in sport as well as having practices in place that also protect and support all of the good coaches and volunteers that we already have within our sports system. So we've already taken you through some of the logistics here. So just again, with respect to muting lines and, and unmuting lines, uh, up on your top left-hand corner of your screen here in Adobe Connect, I said you'll see um, a microphone or a little speaker. I said you can use those items up there to record or to mute your line. Okay. I'm just going to show you a sample resource here. So, uh, Kate, if I could get you to load the video. And while the content's I'm loading, happy. yes, this is a video that we've developed that you could use with your local groups. ...of Canada. When we launched the responsible... ...coaching movement in, in 2016... Canada. When we launched... I'm going to start it from the beginning and hope that it just catches up with yourself. Um, again, if you have your, your line on, can you please mute it so we just don't have that background noise? Hello. I'm Lorraine Lafreniere, CEO of the Coaching Association of Canada. When we launched the Responsible Coaching Movement in 20. with the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Sport. Our goal was to work collectively to support, strengthen and protect anyone getting audio? Canada's robust sports system. No audio. Okay, I'm going to try to one that more end, time. We designed the movement to empower we will sport sure organizers. This link sent out because it's a quick, short video. It's a great video of Lorraine explaining what uh, the responsible coaching movement is. Okay, well, it's not going to work, so I'm really sorry about that. I'm not sure why it hasn't worked, but it, that's what it is, is that short video about what the Responsible Coaching Movement is. 
So I think we'll just skip past that and we'll go right into the video afterwards. Of Shelly's presentation, and we'll make sure you get this video afterwards so that you can use that as a resource yeah, and to share with your organization. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm sorry Shelley, about the, the video here as well. So again, this is a, a video that's available on YouTube. It's a, about a two minute and 45 second video that takes a real quick look at the responsible coaching movement. So again, it's a resource to support you here moving forward. So just quickly, uh, the responsible coaching movement's been broke down into a number of different phases. And so right now we are starting off with phase one and, and taking a look at ways to really develop and support responsible coaching from a policy development and a protection of youth perspective. So again, the first phase is keeping sport healthy and safe. It's a call to action. So we're actually looking for individual sport organizations, provincial sport organizations, and national sport organizations to take a pledge to say that we are all going to be working together and doing Pardon? We're going to be working together to make sports safe for children. So, Kate, are you getting the feedback too? Yeah, we just need everyone to mute their lines if they can please do that. So the three areas that we're going to focus on, one is rule of two. And today's focus will be very much around rule of two. We'll also talk a little bit about background screening and then respect and ethics training. So we're going to take a look at ways to support you around the rule of, of two. If you ask yourself why should your organization be part of it, that sports have a legal and ethical responsibility to mitigate risk for athletes, especially minors in the vulnerable sector. So there's a duty of care that comes into play when we're working with minors in vulnerable sector. The RCM is a proactive means to communicate and act on the Canadian sports system's commitment to address key areas of risk. And if we go back to 2012 or even further back into 1994, there were reports developed and research done around organizations focusing on the pr principles of value-based sport policies and sport programs. So again, responsible coaching is a step in that direction. So we're going to start off here now with our first poll questions. So again, we want to make this interactive to make sure that we get the most, make the most of your time here today and, and that. So what we'd like to know is how does your organization currently demonstrate your duty of care in supporting minors and the vulnerable sector off the field of play? So we're not looking about the on field of play. In sport, we do a great job of protecting youth, like with helmets, for example, or shin pads in soccer, that sort of thing. But we're looking for off the field of play. So what does your organization do with respect to policies around social, around travel policy, or around training camp environments? Just going to give you a couple of minutes here to, to answer the two questions. If you think about travel policies, what we're looking at there are, you know, do you have rule, rules or policies around individuals traveling? in cars, hotel rooms, training camp environments, you know, how many coaches do you need for, for your, your coach to athlete ratios, that sort of thing. Okay. 
Dave, just give you another 20 seconds here to wrap this up. So it looks like from, from some of the answers to the questions here, it's going to lead us here into to the next question that we have, and it's what are the areas of concern for your sport organizations in implementing some of the answers that came up on the previous question? So what are some areas of concern that your organization has right now with respect to policy or your implementation around protecting minors in the vulnerable sector. And just quickly, just some examples that we, we've seen and heard of are small organizations may only have one coach in their area and so they're trying to think of other you know, examples that you know they're asking people to to coach and so therefore they feel bad about about asking for kind of more information and not just asking people but sometimes they feel like they're begging people to coach or take on a task now, those are a couple of examples let's give you a couple about 30 seconds here to, to wrap that one up <laughs> So just, just a reminder here to everyone to, to mute your line. So to mute, in order to mute your line, we'll need you to go up to the top left. going on here in the background right now so there's a com conversation so we're, 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 we're trying to go through and, and manually mute everyone's lines who are speaking because that we can't really proceed with um, Shelly speaking with the background noise so we're trying to identify all the lines that are that are speaking and trying to manually mute each of them so um, for those of you who actually are listening, I appreciate it. And those of you who are maybe not paying attention, we'll try and get to manually. Kate, can you hear me? Yep. Kate, it's Catherine. It's probably someone's phone, not their computer. So they have to mute their phone, not the computer itself. So with, with respect to vicarious liability, I'm going to, to, just in the interest of people's times, I'll put the slides up 
on the screen and I'll allow you to read them. But we have pending yeah. right now with our uh, with the other right. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so we went out and, and sought a legal opinion summary because a number of organizations were concerned about the risk to themselves as volunteers or risk to their organization around the preparation and planning for responsible coaching and that they were wondering if they signed on to the pledge would that put them in a, a situation where they were of more risk and that what we found actually is that under vicarious liability that indirect risk is results results from an indirect or an organization, sorry, being held responsible for misconduct of another party because of an, a relationship that exists between them. So, for example, uh, a national sport organization may, may be held liable um, in a case where they know uh, a local association's had, um, you know, something going on and that the local association hasn't done anything about it or that the national organization hasn't done anything about it. The situation that they were aware of. So sport organizations can be held responsible for misconduct of coaches because of the relationship and that case law has also shown that vicarious liability can be based on the volunteer action or volunteer inaction. Damages have been awarded for abuse of vulnerable victims and those cases have been on the rise, but as is the culture right across um, the, you know, Canadian case law. And that, you know, what we're saying here with, with and around the responsible coaching movement and what our legal counsel has, has let us know that we need to do a gap analysis and that's all of us through sport. And that is why the responsible coaching movement was born because there was a realization that we had a real gap in our Canadian sports system and that that gap was providing opportunities for unethical people to enter. And so now it's trying to take a look at what can we do to minimize those gaps, maybe to, to change them and to, to come together as a united front for the protection of children. So Again, failure to take steps to prevent sexual abuse from occurring may lead to vicarious liability and that sport organizations without proper protocols in place may provide an environment in which certain individuals in positions of power, which would be coaches in this case, uh, may have the opportunity to be alone with a young athlete. And that organizations must take steps to avoid potential risks to the community and to children in the community and the vulnerable sector in our communities. And this requirement becomes increasingly important if other organizations are taking those steps and you're aware of them, but you may not be. So that would, would um, show that if people realize that, hey, we need to take steps and that all of us would be better together taking those steps. And so Again, the purpose of today's webinar is to really take a look at some of the best practices or other practices that have been um, used and, and developed and shared back with us here in sport that we are going to share forward here with you to, to assist you in taking those steps. Now, again, today's focus is around the rule of two and the implementation of the rule of two. And my question to each of you with respect to your organization are what are your specific concerns with being able to implement the rule of two? I'll just give you a minute to answer that question.
Okay, I'm seeing not enough coaches or not enough coaches or adults. Robin, can you scroll scroll through that for me? Thank you. So costs, rent speeds. So for those of you on the phone, there's not enough coaches or adults. Uh, we rent space to too many different sport groups. And if we require this, uh, we'd lose their business as many of these sports are volunteer run or limited budget. Uh, lack of female coaches and volunteers. How do we monitor and oversee it? Educating our membership on implementation. Lack of guidelines to assist. Um, assist members, uh, for instance, uh, follow achievable steps to success. Small clubs, participant ratio, uh, trip and camp budgets are only allowed for two. Okay, so those are some things we're going to get into here a little bit later. So thank you for taking the time to, to answer that. Now, the rule of two, when we initially put this forward, what we had said is, uh, and, and quote, and a lot of the feedback came back from the province of British Columbia, so thank you uh, to those of you that, that have been active and, and engaged with uh, Laura and Lorraine and, and via sport members. But the rule of two started off to say that you needed to have two certified coaches. Now, a number of our programs don't even have... Um, levels of certification for a lot of their sport. So this now has been modified to say the rule of two and ideally it's you want to have um, two or more people and two or more adults ideally in a situation that would protect the minor athlete. So again we're not saying all the time now that it's two or more certified coaches and again, if you have two, two or more certified coaches, then we recommend that. But it, this is not so much a rule as we've listed it. It is more of recommendation. And then we want to make sure that an athlete and a coach are not left in a situation alone. And we'll get, again, in more detail. So the where do we begin? And we've been asked that question a lot. So we're saying that we need to begin with a policy audit. You need to take a look at what are your current policies as an organization, then we need to develop and update the policy around a code of conduct, travel, coaches agreements, athlete agreements, the importance of reference checks and screening, and I'll get into that as well, boards, coaches, parent education, and we want to start with small controllable groups. So we're not saying to you that you need to make this system wide across the board to begin with. So some organizations have started with only their national team athletes and programs. Other organizations, some of the provincial groups that have signed on, have signed on and said, okay, we're going to do this for, you know, our provincial teams for um, Canada Games or our provincial teams for, uh, again, some of the PSOs for their um, provincial championships or the regional, regional teams, etc. So we're saying take off like small chunks and, and implement it where you can and grow from there. Now, this is so it's a small screen, but this is a, uh, the next, next page here that we move to is an overview of an audit checklist that we have available for everybody on the call, as well as um, a tool that's on our website. And the way that we develop the audit checklist for you is taking a look at really what, what do you need to do first to try to help you walk through the steps. So we're saying to begin with that if, uh, for children in vulnerable sector that a parent or guardian consent form and that the way the checklist works is that yes, if you have that in place, then great, you move on to the next step. If not, you create and use a consent form. The next item that you need to take a look at is a code of conduct policy. Ensure that that is up to date. And again, um, the reason that we see a blue hyperlink on your screen for those of you that, that have uh, the, the um, screen access or those of you right now that don't, uh, we have a hyperlink to the code of conduct 
policy and that hyperlink will take you to some examples around items with code of conduct that you could put into place. And I'll touch on another um, specific code of conduct point here uh, on my next slide. Coach agreements, how does the coach and the organization interact? Even if it's a volunteer coach, do you have a coaching agreement with that coach? Athlete agreements, what are your expectations for the athlete? Travel policy. Now, within the travel policy, we're also going to speak a little bit here about the rule of two policy. And the rule of two policy, again, um, I showed you earlier, uh, again, for those of you that can see the screen, that the rule of two means that you need to have two adults in an area, ideally, or an, uh, at least three people in a room, so never a one-on-one -on -one interaction behind a closed door. So I'm just going to move here now to the next slide. Now, this here is an example of what we call our background screening matrix. And I'm going to tie this back to the rule of two and, and which areas are critically important from our perspective. So within your sport organization, that we have areas with, of working with children that have low, medium, or high risk. And areas of low risk, for example, would be a non-volunteer parent. And it, the people that have this, this screen in front of them, on the left-hand side, we're saying for the non-volunteer parent that they need to take part in a position briefing or an orientation. So does your organization run an orientation session for beginning parents? Or do your coaches run an orientation session for parents to begin a season. And so these parents are low risk, they're involved in low risk assignments, they're not in a supervisory role with children or vulnerable sector, they're not directing others, and they're not involved in a financial cash management, or they, just, they don't have access to, to the minors. Now for a youth volunteer, we're saying that you need to, to do a little more work with the youth volunteer, so they need an application form, one letter of reference. And even if that's from a teacher, we're saying that it's, it's um, important that you do get a letter of reference for that youth volunteer. Position briefing orientation, so they need to take part in what your organizations are about. Okay, just a sec here, uh, Robin and Kate, they've got the slides aren't showing. Okay, I'm not sure if that's the case for, for everybody here. Um, so what I'll do is just, I'll speak uh, just more briefly to this form uh, that you can... Yeah, this is a slide for me. Okay. Yeah, the slides are showing are showing for me. All right, for for individuals who are not able to to see them, we're, we'll send out the slide the um, slides to you with the black background screening matrix that I'm talking to, as well as the um, audit checklist. Okay, so I'll just I'll be briefer here then with the the background screening slide. So medium risk positions are individuals that are involved in assignments where they may be in a supervisory role with, with individuals. They may have some cash management in your organization. And they may have some limited access to minors or people with disability. And so that would be your assistant coaches. Depending on your, your sport, it could be your volunteer head coach or your sport director. And for those people, we're saying that they need to, to apply for the position. They need at least one letter of reference, a briefing from your sport. If they're driving children, they need to be 
Um, they need to bring in a driver's a, uh, abstract. And you should ask them for a disclosure form and a, um, a record check as well. And I noticed that some of you said in the, in the uh, first question around duty of care that you're already doing that. Now, on the far right. Uh, okay, that's flipped up. I didn't see that. Sorry. Oh, Simon has a question in the note. Simon here. No. Is he a second? Yeah. But he says, look, he says, looking at the notes on the bottom, if they do have access to people Absolutely. with a disability, would they all so, move into the well, high-risk zone? Yes, that's a, a very good question. So vulnerable sector uh, individuals all go over to the far right-hand side of this, the screen. So whether they're paid coaches or volunteer coaches in those roles, sorry, they move to the far right-hand side of the screen. And that anybody who occupies in a position of trust and or authority and have that supervisory role, they direct others, they're involved in the financial and cash management of your organization, and they have access to persons with disability, that we're saying there that it's important that you get the vulnerable sector check done and in BC we know that, that you can work with the, the BC government uh, uh, for that and like via sport can help direct you specifically in that area um, and we're also saying that instead of just one reference check that you need a second reference check so um, one of the things that that um, other sports have recommended to us is that you make sure that you go back to their previous sport employer. So if somebody was coaching soccer previously, that you go back and you actually speak to the person that hired them in that organization or that would have evaluated them in that organization. And it, in some cases, if there's not a process, that at least speak to the club president. Have them uh, provide a reference from that group. Okay. Now this next slide is a slide that is uh, an excerpt from uh, an organization called the Canadian Center for Child Protection. And this organization has done a lot of the legwork on policy and procedures and that um, to support sport organizations and that around development of codes of conduct. So it takes some of the work from my perspective, right out of your hands, and, and they've spent a number of years putting this work together uh, to support organizations in Canada. And one of the key statements that they have stated within your code of conduct, that you need to state that an adult's actions must be in reaction to a child's needs, not in response to an adult's needs. And there's four other additional points that, that they, um, have been captured there below. But one, for example, would be uh, employees and volunteers of our organization must not to offer the child any special treatment that falls outside of the organization's mandate or that may or may not appear to place the child in any sort of risk of exploitation. So. They've got some great pieces, again, that have already been um, created for you that could be just taken and cut and pasted and put into your policy. Now, I'm going to, to respond to some of the, the comments that, that we saw earlier here uh, in the webinar. And so, one of the issues was that we don't have enough coaches to have a second certified coach. So to try to support that, again, these are solutions that have come from our membership and that if you see something that, that you think you should add or could add to our list, we are really open to uh, wanting to, to learn from you and to be able to share this forward. So possible solutions to not having enough co coaches, 
well, if you go back to that screening matrix, that it it's more important, like the less coaches you have, the screening and the reference checks that you do for your coaches become more critical in your work on the front end. Okay? That the second person may not be a coach necessarily, so you know, is there another parent? Is there an elder in your community? Um, and you know, in some cases, it's like, can you have a teammate uh, be brought along so that it, it is not a private one-on-one -on -one off the field of play? We spoke to this earlier. We said start with small controllable groups. And the other thing is that if there's a situation where as a coach, you are going to be alone with an athlete. That one of the recommendations was to be transparent about it. And so if a coach is alone uh, with an athlete, it's like let others know and so that you start to know patterns. And so here, uh, for example, um, you know, if you're in a sporting situation that, that in fact uh, may require you to, to be alone with that athlete, then as an organization, you need to do, again, a more thorough job on the screening on the front end and to be transparent with the parents. So it might be, for example, um, you know, I think a rowing example from BC was if an individual was, um, you know, at a boathouse and, you know, other coaches and parents and that had picked up their kids and the coach was alone with a certain athlete, it would be to send a quick text you know, to the parent or a text to the um, leader of your sport organization just to let them know that you're alone so that you could start then to watch for patterns. Shelly, we have a question from Nancy from Cross Country Skiing asking for older athletes, can there be two athletes if there's only one coach? Can there be two and athletes and one coach? On. If that's a situation that the parents have agreed to and your organization has agreed to, then what we would again re recommend is that you do what you can to do a way more thorough job on the screening. So. I think that that's like it's an organization by organization's perspective and I'm not how old are the athletes that you're speaking about uh, Nancy okay, sorry I didn't 14 I think, you know, to, to begin with here, I said it's it's making sure, again, that the coach and one athlete are, are not alone. Um, and, and that's, it's a starting place, right? So you're in that situation. We're recommending that you do what you can to try to, to get a second coach um, in to support you. But in cases where you absolutely can't, that it's making sure then that there's a second athlete and not just a coach and an athlete alone. And Simon has a, a, a good question around um, what do I do with an athlete comes so, to me with a personal issue? You know, in, in that case, Simon and I've, I've someone else in the room. We'll say I've been that coach, right? So it's how do you have a conversation? So if if that athlete is going to uh, disclose something to you that you may in fact need to bring in like a team doctor. So I'm not sure the level of athlete that you're working with. A team doctor or mental skills coach or making sure that that you're still in a, in a place where others can see you so for example then the the office that I worked out of it would be uh, making sure that you know doors are open and the uh, screen um, like the screens aren't pulled for the windows but if the athlete comes with a personal issue it, it's finding a place where you're not talking to them one-on-one -on -one behind a closed door and that's for the protection of the athlete and for the protection of you, uh, the coach. Okay. 
The next question um, here too, or the next issue that had been brought up was around the financing of the rule of two. And with, with the financing, again, we're, we're suggesting there, like a, again, similar to I think Nancy's questions around, around um, you know, they've got two 14 year old athletes and a coach that the ideal scenario again is at least, you know, two coaches and the, the athlete, but if you're not in that place, where can you start? What steps can you take to better protect the, at, the child, the coach, et cetera? So in financing rule of two, again, start with a small group and then build from there. Um, Skate Canada has implemented a safety tax for their sport and they charge $3 per child uh, to build a fund in order to, to help support around the travel funds uh, for a second coach. And another suggestion at our Partners Congress Roundtable was to seek out a safety sponsor uh, for your organization from within your community. The other thing too that, um, and, and this is maybe to Simon's question or point, but if you have an individual that needs to have a conversation with you, can you take that individual to a, a like a common area? So if you have, um, you know, a, like a common, kind of, say like a Starbucks or whatever in your sport facility or something like that, can you have that conversation you know, at a table with the athlete where it's a kind of away from from um, other individuals but not in a non-public place. Now in saying that, we're, we're also saying that we don't want coaches inviting an athlete to have, you know, a private coffee or a private dinner uh, with an athlete. So can that be changed and can you set up policy around it? And then next step is that if it is absolutely not possible to implement rule of two, that as coaches it's, it's, and our sport leaders, it's really important to educate your coaches and your leaders on grooming behaviors as well as your parents on grooming behaviors that could potentially, they need to potentially watch for in uh, individuals that are going to be working with children. And we have resources on our site as well around grooming behaviors as well. Uh, so does the uh, organization Commit to Kids. Okay, so we're going to go back to a poll question again for you. And then what are some ways that parents can support the rule of two in your organization? give you a minute here to answer that. Supervision. Right, so some of the answers that are coming up are become a coach and volunteer, advertise as volunteer positions available, volunteer supervision during practices and travel plus clear guidelines on the role of an adult chaperone, volunteers to be present as a second adult, being on time for pickups, yeah that's a good one there too, volunteer to be a safety person, Volunteer to be adult supervisor coaches, educate parents, right? So again, like all of these little nuggets that have been shared provide a lot of value to other organizations. So we really appreciate you taking the time here to provide your insight.
the, the one here that's just come up, the help facilitate the rule of two on a volunteer basis and have parents rotate sticking around or traveling. So that's the first time that I've, I've heard it presented like that. And I know already that there's organizations we spoke with that um, that that nugget as well can be a, a great share forward. And then the read the material supplied uh, by our organization. So again, there's some great tools that have, have uh, been developed by you know, Scouts Canada um, and uh, one on billeting, uh, for example, by uh, Hockey Canada that, that are valuable tools to share forward and that everything that is on our site is, is free to you to, to access in this area. So quite simply, based on what you've stated there, that give parents the permission to work with you in the best interest for their children. And, and as organizations, that we need to reframe some of our conversation because we're saying parents, we, we don't want you around because of the complaining and that sort of, of thing. However, we're saying, no, we need to invite parents back in. We need parents to feel comfortable being a part of the sport and sport organization. And as leaders and coaches that we need to be open and okay with parents asking questions that are around the best interest of their, their children, especially, you know, around the organization and your policies with respect to the rule of two, that it's okay to ask questions around hiring practices and screening processes. And that also asking, it's like, what is an organization's expectation of a coach around education and training? So the example I'll use there, that currently we all expect, if, if our, we're going to send our children to school, we all expect that our teachers have taken education and, and training and they are going to teach our children. And we ask, it's like, do they expect the same that our, our when somebody is coaching our children, you know, do we expect that they've taken their NCCP training and the like, and, and right now, that I would think that there's some that assume that, yes, that isn't the case, but there's others that we know don't um, believe that, that uh, or, or don't even feel comfortable asking whether or not the coach has taken any training. And in some cases, we're, again, asking people last minute to come out and help us out. So we all come from, from a variety of different backgrounds with different expectations. And we are saying that, that we want to encourage our coaches down the pathway to, to education, starting with NCCP training, uh, with taking make, make ethical decisions, and that there are other resources out there to be able to support our coaches in their development. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because uh, on the parents' involvement examples because you guys uh, uh, in your answers in the poll had, had answered a lot of these same questions and made a lot of the same points. Um, it is important here to note, though, that, that we do need to have the parent and legal guardian's written permission for rides and vehicles. I think that was alluded to in the answers, um, but just making sure that we're diligent as well in that area. It goes back into the very first part of the audit around parent permissions to travel. Now, we also need to let parents know that that visits to, to homes by athletes, visits to coaches' homes, aren't a co common or normal thing. So it's discouraged to make sure that, that um, athletes are not visiting the homes of of their coaches, especially in one-on-one -on -one, uh, situations. Now, I know that, that Via Sport BC has done a lot of work around inclusion and safe sport and safe practices and inclusive environments. Um, just included this slide here just as a quick reminder that it's the same here uh, with respect to rule of two that we need to make sure that we're creating a safe and inclusive environment for our athletes and, 
and that so uh, just a quick point to that now I've moved now onto the slide with coach ex uh, coaches action examples now we want to ensure an, an open and observable environment for all interactions between adults and athletes and those include so going back to Simon's comment earlier it's like leaving the door open when meeting uh, moving away from others in a public space, but making sure that we're staying within eyesight and that we work to avoid private or one-on-one -on -one situations unless they are open and observable. Now, the, again, the coach should never invite or have athletes in their home, especially without the permission of the athlete's parent or legal guardian. And that we ensure that athletes do not ride in a coach or volunteer's vehicle without another adult or athlete present. And again, there are certain situations that it may happen, and if it is going to happen, that we're saying that prior parental written permission needs to be obtained, and that parent needs to be aware of it, and that coach would need to be um, better screened. Are there any questions so far uh, with regards to coach the coach action examples? Again, to, just to travel, which was an early uh, question, uh, travel or private meetings, again, we need to have more than one adult present. So that seems to be the reoccurring theme, more than one adult present. And for overnight travel, then we want to look at pairing athletes by gender and age. Now, uh, Kate had provided me with an example there from, from one of the sports. Uh, Kate, do you want to share that? where they had three athletes um, per room. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. I, I think Leslie's on the, on the line from Special Olympics. I know Special Olympics has some policies around travel. I'm not sure if it's specific to BC or Canada. So, um, but they have some, I believe their policies are around three athletes in, in a hotel room and then uh, two are in one bed, but one's actually in a sleeping bag, so that there's, so that there, there's some, some distance between athletes, which is a little bit different than what we're talking about here. So I don't know if, if, um, if Leslie's on, if she wanted to speak to that. But. Okay. Just wait for Leslie's comment here. She's typing. You're done, Susie. You're done. <laughs> so Leslie's just typing. Um, we'll but yeah, I'm sorry if that's not, if that's not accurate. But, um, okay. We'll read Leslie's comment there once there. it's typed up um, here. That, that is and a, a vulnerable you know population. What we're saying, too, that, that when, you're, when you only have one athlete and one coach that's traveling to a competition, that suggestions have come out as well where you set up uh, with a buddy club. So you're going to be competing, um, you know, in, in another community. And instead of a coach and an athlete uh, sharing a room that we're saying that that's not acceptable, we're saying that the coach and maybe a, a coach from another organization, uh, you know, stay in a room and that the athletes stay in a room if there are financial situations. And if parents are not okay with that, then the parents need to travel with the athlete to become part of, of um, this safe, safe travel measure. Okay, did Leslie's comment yeah, come through on that end? Perfect, thank you. No, she's not. So I just asked her if she um, has anything she wants to share. We can circulate that afterwards. I think we're going to wrap your with uh, you know when you, when you take a look at advancing your work with your organization with responsible coaching movement and the rule of two can you let us know like how can we support you and I'll say other than funding <laughs> and that but uh, other than funding how could we support you in implementing the rule of two and developing the rule of two so 
in, in areas, for example, like social media campaigns, uh, templates, recognition, etc. Like we're we're open to hear your feedback here. And I'm not able to see the answers there. Can we can you expand that column? The polls. Okay. So the answers that are coming up for those of you that are in, in uh, listen only. So templates for appropriate language um, needed in a code of conduct form. Education to parents as they can help enforce, provide best practice templates, regular updates of best practices, social media campaigns would be perfect, draft policies. So as that continues to, to be populated, I'm just going to talk a little about our resources. So on our website currently, we have three short videos in English and French uh, currently uh, that um, also have like an attempt at the video we showed of Lorraine that also have um, uh, give me one second here um, the uh, words written below this the screen as well for for the hearing impaired um, the other resources that we have are are um, access links to organizations like the Canadian Centre for Child Protection and Commit to Kids. So that as well is another another tool we have available for you. That from a, another social media campaign, so Lorraine's video that we attempted to show you and I spoke about at the beginning, that is a two and a half minute to three minute video that outlines what the, the rule or sorry what uh, responsible coaching movement is and that video was created for sport organizations to be able to share that with their coaches their parents uh, the people uh, on their boards and that too to make uh, your life a whole lot easier um, because we do know that this is going to be work but we'll say that the responsible coaching movement and the work around the responsible coaching movement is valuable work to, for protecting children. So for, for again, for us here on, on this end, I wanted to thank everybody for their time. We're going to encourage you to, you know, to take the pledge to be involved in the responsible coaching movement, be part of the group that is working here together to make sports safer for children and that you know subscribe to the philosophy that we are here together protecting children so thank you for your time today and if you have any comments you have items to share and that with us here moving forward in addition to what you've typed into the poll please don't hesitate reach out and contact either myself or kate uh, Kate and Robin, do you guys have anything to add from your end? Uh, no, I think that just reinforcing what you said that that anything that we can do to help either the education or or helping anything we can hear from you in terms of what do you need to make your program safer in this regard? Please talk. Are to there us any about any it. other we questions? Towards that with you. So, were there any other questions in the chat? I think that's nope. So far, so good. Okay. Well, we'll wrap it up there. Th Shelley, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. We will send out all these resources to everyone afterwards. And again, we encourage you to, to reach out to us so that we can work together as a sport community. To thank you. These areas. Thank you. Goodbye. Happy afternoon.